Well, hello. Um, I'm Max Wolter, the DNR fisheries biologist for Sawyer County in Wisconsin. Um, this is the recording of the Sawyer County Fisheries Forum, which is typically an in-person meeting that we have uh, sometime in the winter. Uh, this year with the current public health concerns, uh, we decided it was, it was probably not a good idea to, to have that meeting as normal. So um, what I've done here is I've recorded the presentation I was going to give and, and I'll kind of talk through and give the usual narration. So, you know, you'll get basically, hopefully the, the full meeting experience here um, and you can view it online at your, at your own uh, pace. And um, we are gonna try to figure out a way to, you know, get comments and questions from people and maybe we'll answer those in, in another follow-up video, something like that. Uh, but for the time being, you know, this is the information we wanted to make sure we're getting out to people before uh, the 2020 open water fishing season. Um, we'll talk about uh, what we saw in our surveys in 2019. We're going to talk about a variety of different special uh, projects happening in the area. And then we'll talk about some, some regulation changes and kind of what the timeline looks like for those and how people can give feedback as usual, stuff like that. So um, I hope this format works for people. Um, you're going to be stuck with my little head floating in the bottom right hand corner here. I tried to move the content around, so hopefully I'm not blocking anything that you would otherwise want to see. I did have to cut a few videos, um, and we were hoping to have Chance Brown. You can see him listed in the schedule there. Um, he's a student at UW-Stevens Point, really you know, smart young man, and he's doing some interesting work on Bofin. We were hoping he would join us for the Fisheries Forum, but going to this online format, that's, that's not going to be possible. So we'll try to provide another opportunity to hear about um, chances work um, locally. Um, so we'll kind of jump in, um, I'll try and move through this in a pretty concise way. And, and then again, if, if people have questions or comments or whatever, um, we're going to try to develop a way that we can we can still get those. Because That's always been a great part of the fisheries forum is, is being able to interact with people, which obviously <laughs> can be more difficult. So, so let's talk about surveys. Um, this is going back to spring 2019. Um, one of the lakes we spent a lot of time on was Round Lake. Uh, we survey Round every three years. And, and so um, we were out there looking at basically all species. Uh, walleye was, was kind of our first priority and the walleye population looked really good. You can see the size up above me here. Um, that green shaded area, that's, that's the kind of the open harvest slot where you can have up to three fish between 15 to 20. A lot of them are in that slot. Um, Contrast that to some of the other lakes we're going to look at later. A lot of legal size fish, pretty nice, good size distribution, good size structure. Um, abundance looked fairly good. I mean, it's not like it's overrun with walleye, but um, there's certainly a, a good number of them there. Um, smallmouth, you know, Round Lake, really well known for smallmouth. We saw higher abundance than our last few surveys, so, you know, plenty of them out there. The size is still, you know, really, really good. Um, not quite on par with what we saw the last time, and it's hard to say whether that's, you know, our sampling didn't hit the timing right or something like that, or maybe there have been some changes. Uh, we'll continue to look, to look at this one. Uh, of course, there's regulations that changed a couple years ago, uh, putting on an 18-inch minimum length limit. So ideally, that's going to be protecting some of these fish, giving them a chance to get big. So still a great smallmouth fishing uh, destination. Um, Muskie, everybody's been excited about muskie and Round Lake. We were excited to get out there and survey them, and, and certainly we caught some really nice fish. You can see this one here. Um, number of fish over 50 inches handled. Didn't really, it was, it was challenging to catch them. And in fact, we probably saw more muskies cruising the shallows than we were able to actually get into the nets. Um, that's just kind of how it goes on Round Lake with that clear water. Uh, but, but still, a lot of things to be excited about here for a muskie fishery. We haven't seen anything that indicates that there's natural reproduction happening. So, um, you know, the fishery is going to be supported through stocking and the DNR has been able to do that um, for the last few years. So hopefully a lot more pictures like this in, in Round Lake's future. You know, it's kind of this kind of an incredible lake because it, it's one that seems to do everything pretty well. You got the walleye, you got the smallmouth, you got the muskie. And the panfish look pretty good too. Um, really nice crappies, and, and improvement in crappie size since the last time we were there. Bluegill size has ticked up a little bit too. This is one of those panfish special regulation lakes. 
Yellow perch continue to be a bit trickier, um, trickier to survey, trickier to tell what's going on, and, and people want those big perch. It, it's kind of unclear how we can get those at this point in time, but you know it is something we're still monitoring and, and, and looking at, looking for ideas. Um, but you know the other two main panfish species are seem to be doing quite well. Um, Northern pike. This later we'll talk about the pike improvement project on the Chippewa flowage, and maybe you've heard me talk about the LCO project in the past. Round Lake is kind of the model for what I call a well-behaved pike population. They don't seem to get really dense. You don't see this the size. Um, let me try this quick. Let's see if this works. You don't see this size histogram just stacked up with fish in the in the high teens, low twenties. It's kind of low um, low abundance. Pretty pretty even distribution of size across the range, including some some really some really big ones, uh, which is fun to see. So, um, if all our pike populations behaved like this, I'd be very happy. But we know that's that's not really the case. So we're going to move from from Round Lake, where we spent a lot of time, to Tiger Cat and Mud Callahan. Um, we did spend a fair amount of time on both these lakes too, but I'm not going to run through all the different species. Kind of the main thing that we're interested in here is the, the native muskie populations that have always been pretty high abundance in both tiger cat and mud callahan seem to be changing. We are not catching muskies at the same rate in our surveys. I'm sure anglers are not catching them at the same rate too. We're hearing that from people. Um, and a lot of this is probably related to northern pike getting into the, the lakes relatively recently. Um, first records of pike in, in tiger cat were in the late 90s. and um, you know, we've just seen the numbers increase since then, more and more showing up in our surveys. Pike are absolutely, you know, reproducing and reproducing pretty successfully in these water bodies. And that seems to be coming at, at the muskies' expense. So um, the catch rate we had for muskies in both these lakes is, is probably the lowest we've had maybe ever. Um, we are looking at some options for, for what we might be able to do to turn that situation around. Uh, we're working with Muskies, Inc. We're working with lake associations. Um, we would certainly encourage people who are out there you know, harvest pike that you catch legally, um, five per day, bag limit still applies, um, but, but harvest them even down to those, those smaller ones, which are, are pretty abundant in, in tiger cat. Um, there's no indication that this situation is totally out of control yet. The, the pike are, are there, they're reproducing, but um, they're not incredibly abundant yet. So um, it's mere takeaway for, for these uh, we went to Spring Lake, which is always interesting. Um, quite an impressive little lake in terms of just the amount of fish we get. We caught tons and tons of bluegill, crappie, perch. Size was not exceptional for any of them. Um, probably the, you know, the, the standout species as far as high quality fishing opportunities is largemouth bass, and you can see the size structure there. Tons of largemouth, 15 to almost 21 inches. Um, really nice, nice fishery. Uh, there, there had been some concerns about winter kill. Uh, we didn't see anything in Spring Lake that would make us concerned. In fact, we had some really hard days because the nets were so loaded down uh, with fish. So, Spring Lake looks good. Pike pike population looks pretty good in spring as well. Um, let's switch gears here and talk about uh, trout for a second in the Namakagan River. Uh, we have an annual site that we do on the Namakagan River, um, kind of in the Sealy area, and um, that allows us to do these cool um, time series things. So there's three different lines going through time here. Um, started in 2008, and I included our 2019 survey um, as our most recent, and, and you can see some ups and downs. There's kind of this peak around 2010. We had, you know, good reproduction that led to good adults. Um, then we had this this tough period during 2013 2014 where um, we lost a lot of our um, a lot of our trout um, in those really hard hard winters polar vortex years etc. We've been slowly building that back up the last few years. You know we've seen the adult numbers come up, so that's been really encouraging. We're still at a pretty good density here. Um, you no, know, I, I have other animations that tell the same story here. Um, so in 2019, you know we saw something for, for trout abundance that was pretty similar to our long-term average, but we saw really good abundance of big trout. This, these dots are, are the um, catch rate of trout over 12 inches, and that's about as high as we've seen going back through time. And we had this huge year class, um, the biggest year class we've ever 
recorded on the Namakagan. So um, lots of things to be excited about there. We have big trout currently. We have um, a lot of small trout coming up. The future of that fishery looks really strong. So um, I think people will be able to enjoy that if they're not already. This is a good time of year to get out and, and certainly a, a good activity that you could do even if you're trying to kind of you know, keep your distance from other people. Um, get out on the water on these nice uh, spring days once the temperature gets over like 40, 45. These trout are biting pretty well and, and should be a lot of fun. Um, another thing we did on a river was um, our sturgeon rodeo, as I call it. Uh, this is um, something we do on the Chippewa River below the Radisson flowage and that particular dam. You get a lot of sturgeon running up there. That's a big reach of river going all the way down to the Holcomb flowage. Big sturgeon population and in the right year uh, we can catch hundreds of sturgeon underneath that dam. Uh, 2019 we didn't catch incredible numbers. I think we caught about 30 or 40 sturgeon. Uh, but it's always impressive for people to see these these big fish, these dinosaurs. Um, we get a lot of great data. They live for a very long time, of course, and, and we're pit tagging them all. So, you know, sometimes we'll recapture a fish that we haven't seen for a decade. Um, and then we learn you know, about their growth and, and their spawning timing and, and things like that. So really neat thing. Great cooperative effort. We had a lot of help from other DNR folks um, and uh, great cooperation from the dam operators, too. want to give them a big shout out. Um, Chippewa flowage, and I'll kind of use this to transition to talking about some of our other projects, but um, we surveyed the chip as we do every year. We we're on the west side this year. We saw a walleye abundance that continues to increase as we've put more and more good year classes, larger year classes into the population. Um, that has not led to um, a, a drastic change in the percentage of, of legal sized fish. Um, this last spring, we saw about one in five that were in that legal slot, that, that green zone in, in the above um, figure, and a lot of fish below it. And of course, that's what anglers are reporting, is catching a lot of sublegal fish. Um, we will talk later on about triple flowage regulations, but lots of walleye out there. That's a, that's a good problem to have. The bad problem that we have is, is we have a lot of pike, and their size is, is generally pretty poor. Um, this is similar to situations we have had on other lakes, including LCO. And so in just a second, I'll, I'll talk about kind of some things we've done to address that. Um, 2019, we, we continued to see lots of pike with, without great size. A lot of fish in the high teens and low 20s, and very few fish. I think we had one over 30 inches. Not great. We can do better, we think. Um, we did... We didn't do a musky survey, uh, but our hatchery crew was out on the chip collecting eggs. And uh, some of those uh, fingerlings that are produced from those eggs, we like to bring them back to the, to the water body that we got the eggs from in a lot of cases. And um, that was true this year. We brought 5,000 musky fingerlings back, stocked them into the chip. All those fish were pit tagged. Our local muskies Inc. chapter uh, contributed a lot to that stocking financially and, and supporting those fish at the Governor Thompson Hatchery, getting them as big as possible, which was 12.8 12 12 inches on average, which is a really nice fingerling. Uh, we'd hope they'd be more, certainly, but uh, it was a challenging year to grow fish, so you know I think we should be really happy with what we got. Those fish are going to hopefully do very well out there and be able to compete with everything else out there in the flowage, including all those abundant small pike, and um, you know contribute to the fishery and, and, and keep that musky fishery going out there. We do have some natural reproduction on the chip too, and so you know we're going to be taking a hard look at how much we need to stock, how much can we rely on natural reproduction, and um, trying to chart a course forward on that front. Uh, one of the neat things is kind of a PR type thing um, is this is the second year we did adopt a muskie uh, out of the Governor Thompson Hatchery, and this is run by the Governor Thompson Friends Group. It's called Fish Friends into the Spooner Hatchery. Um, so. You, this is a picture from the public event here. People could come, they could pick out a muskie. These fish are all tagged by our crew um, with support from Muskies Inc., Lake Association, Great Resort Association. And um, the, once they have that adopted fish, they get a certificate with its number and where, when it was stocked and stuff like that. If we catch these later on, we send a report to the person who adopted them. And we have caught a number of the adopted fish from 2016, which is the first year we did this. I expect we'll catch some of these 2019 fish too. Um, kind of a neat thing and it, it helps connect people in the community to the fishery. And most of these people who are coming to adopt muskies are not muskie anglers. So, um, you know, 
they, they're curious about this. They want to learn about these fish. And so this is a way we can do that. Um, maybe with a part of the population that isn't even out there necessarily fishing. They just enjoy fish. That's cool. I adopted one for my kid. <laughs> I think the adoption forms will still be available throughout the summer at a lot of the resorts and maybe the Visitors and Convention Bureau. I know there's places you can still do it or you can go to the uh, Fish Friends into the Spooner Hatch website. Okay, let's talk Pike Improvement Project. So um, the Pike Improvement Project uh, was born kind of out of the LCO project. And maybe you've heard me talk about that in the past. In LCO, we were able to use nets to remove a pretty significant portion of the adult pike population that had really poor size. Uh, the goal was to improve pike size, create more room in the fishery for muskie and other predators. Um, and we had a lot of at least short-term success with that in LCO. We did get bigger pike. Um, so we wanted to take that concept and apply it to the ship. However, we knew we weren't going to be able to do the netting here. Um, the pipe are too spread out, the lakes are bigger, the chip is a lot more complex than, than LCO. So we knew we were going to have to find some other way to, to get to this number of, of pike being taken out of the lake. Um, so the Chippewa Flood Resort Association, Property Owners Association, and some other really ingenuitive folks came up with this pike improvement project, which is effectively an incentive system and an educational outreach system to get people uh, interested in harvesting small pike that they were otherwise letting go or probably even just shaking off the hook they didn't even want to touch them. Um, the goal was to get 10,000 pike harvested by anglers and um, you may have seen posters, you may have seen you know Facebook posts, whatever about this, trying to get the word out. Um, every pike that was legally harvested uh, you could enter a raffle ticket, they had a thousand dollar drawing that was supported by the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. We tried to set up little competitions among resorts and, and kind of play into people's competitive nature here. Um, and, you know, it was it was a really, really ambitious um, project. It was really well run by the Resort Association people. And it provided a lot of interesting results because we were able to track the harvest through those raffle tickets. So I'll kind of show some of the, the data on, you know, what happened here with the Pike Improvement Project. So uh, the first one I'm going to show you here is, is pike size. Um, one of the concerns that we had was even with an incentive system and even telling people we need to harvest these small pike, these really abundant ones that you can see here, um, you know, lots of pike, 16 to 21 inches, basically. Those are the ones we needed people to keep. Anglers aren't always interested in doing that. When you look at creels in the past, you know, they're going to start keeping pike more around like 22, 23, 24 inches. Um, so would this actually get people to harvest smaller pike? And what this figure shows is it does appear to have been fairly successful in that. The blue shape uh, here is is what we get in our nets. And then the pink shape is, is what we saw people harvest. And what we wanted to see was a lot of overlap uh, where people were actually harvesting smaller pike at about the same percentage that you know we were seeing them. And so we did fairly well there. Um, one thing that's interesting is, you know, look at all these, I call this the stegosaurus distribution because people were much likely, much more likely to report that they caught a pike that was even numbered in length than odd numbered. Does that mean that they're only catching even numbered pike? No, definitely not. It just means people were estimating what the length was. Um, so, you know, we kind of have to take that with a grain of salt that these are not all measured lengths. This data is not perfect, um, but we do get some indication that people were at least willing to harvest uh, smaller pike at a higher rate than what we've seen in the past. So that's great. Um, what was a little dis more disappointing, I'm sure for everyone involved, is that you know we weren't able to hit our goal. So um, what this figure shows is along the bottom is, is all the different weeks that the project ran. The blue line is just like, you know, steady, even pace. If we got, if we got the, you know, same number of fish every week, what would it take to get us to 10,000? It was about 333 fish a week or something like that. Uh, the orange line is what our actual pace was. So you can see as we're, you know, as we're harvesting pike, um, there's a couple different kind of phases here. This is ice fishing. Not a lot of participation during during ice fishing. It was a tough winter to get out. I know there was a couple events that were going to go out and promote harvest to pike that had to get canceled, stuff like that. Is what it is. Um, we were able to make up a ton of ground in May and June. That was a great period of time for us. We actually caught up with our pace <clears throat> for a brief period of time in late June. And then once you get into 
July and August, unfortunately, the pike get a lot harder to catch just because of their behavior. Um, and also because there was a lot less of them. By the time you got to, you know, July and August, there had already been 6,000 harvested. So um, less opportunities to, to, to even catch and harvest them at all. Um, so we didn't, we didn't hit our 10,000 recorded pike. You know, I've had a lot of people say, yeah, but you know, there's a lot of fish that weren't recorded through this. And that's certainly true. You know, I got emails from people saying, hey, I didn't turn these in, but I caught this many, uh, kept them. Um, we know a fair amount of that happened. However, we'll never know exactly how much. So it's hard to say what the true final number is beyond this 7,486 that were, you know, kind of officially registered as a part of that. So, um, the, the next part of this is going to be, did this make a difference? Did this move the needle? Was that enough harvest, especially for the smaller ones, to improve size structure of pike? Will it create other positive changes in the fishery? Will we see better survival of those stocked muskies? You know, the timing of this was all kind of um, intentional. We wanted to take a bunch of pike out, stock a bunch of muskies in, and try and kind of flip that, that competitive balance. So that's something I'll have to report on next year, um, maybe 2020. Fisheries Forum, maybe that'll be back to being an in-person meeting. We'll see. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, more evaluation and reporting back on this. Another project that has been interesting to work on is on the Coudray River, where we've been looking at both sturgeon and now also smallmouth. Um, I had some videos for this that are cool. I'll have to find another way to show them to people in, in the future. But um, we catch a lot of sturgeon in this river, and it's a small river. It, it's connected to the Chippewa, and that's probably where most of them are coming from. Um, pretty big sturgeon for a water body this size. Uh, this year we caught um, several over 50 inches. I think our biggest was 55. Uh, we're seeing catfish moving back into this river too. There's a lot of red horse. Um, really neat. And um, for those who people who have never fished out there, um, there's a reason the access is is really limited. It's it's tough to get out there. We are trying to work with some of the local townships to develop some access and, and we've had we've made some progress on that we're pursuing some grants and things so uh, you may hear more about the coudere uh, later on um one thing you will hear about um probably in the next year's fisheries forum is, is is in 2019 we initiated a smallmouth bass tagging study so um you know we do a lot of work on smallmouth and lakes but they're very popular in rivers and this set up as a nice a system to study because of its size and because we're already spending a lot of time out there for sturgeon um, and encountering a lot of these smallmouth. So we're going to be able to look at, you know, how well they're growing, uh, how they move around in a river like this, and, and maybe we'll be able to look at genetics because the Coudere system is interesting. You've got the Lake Coudere system at the headwaters with smallmouth, you have the Chippewa River at the outflow with smallmouth, and then you've got smallmouth in the Coudere itself. What do the genetics look like? Are they a mix of the lake and river fish? Are they kind of their own thing? Um, there was a dam at the lower end of the coudere that was removed. How has that changed stuff? So you'll hear more about this in the future. But um, what we did is we, we pit tagged a bunch of smallmouth, uh, over 100, in the cheek and all up and down the river. And we're going to try to go back out and recapture as many of those as we can in 2020. Each of them at a GPS location. So the next time we catch them, we'll know how far they've moved from, from year to year. So that'll be cool. You'll hear about it. Uh, another kind of cool... Outreach type thing is we do a lot of work with Northern Waters Environmental School because they're obviously very outdoor focused and um, they did a, the Trout in the Classroom program, which is something that TU has, has supported and, and sponsored in a lot of places. Uh, so we had that here in Hayward this last year. They raised brown trout. They talked a lot about brown trout ecology and, and you know thermal requirements. Retired biologist Frank Pratt um, was kind of their instructor on, on this portion of the project and, and so they were able to raise a few fish successfully from egg all the way up into a finger link to stock. And then they got some more from the hatchery and, and stocked those out too into Camp Smith Lake. Um, so hopefully those fish are out there and, and maybe anglers will encounter a few. And, and hopefully these kids learned a lot. You know, it's 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 great program to work with. The kids are pretty enthusiastic and, and they do a lot of their own independent projects looking at uh, stuff like this. So, okay. Um, couple slides here talking about our plans for the next few years and there's two big projects that are going to be soaking up a lot of my cruise time and a lot of time for, for crews around the state really. Um, one is evaluating the special panfish regulations. I mentioned those earlier um, when I was talking about Round Lake which is one of the lakes included in that um, study. Um, so you know the data we collected on Round Lake in 2019 
is, is going to be a part of this evaluation. Uh, we have a lot of other lakes we need to get to in the next two years so that we can provide at least an initial report on what these regulations are doing or, and if they're having the intended effect. So in 2020, there's four lakes we're going to be on that are part of the project, Durfee, Black Dan, and Island. Uh, Black Dan and Island are down in the winter area. And then Barber Lake, also in the winter area, is a control. So even though there's no special panfish regulations there, we're still going to survey it. Um, so we have a comparison point. And then in 2021, um, even more, winter, Lost Land, Teal, Loretta, Windigo, Whitefish, and Lower Holly. So we're going to be really busy looking at panfish. Um, this is primarily bluegill and crappie. And this is going to, you know, potentially take some priority over other work. And so, you know, the way we justify that is if we need to prioritize getting to these lakes to get this data, um, it's going to help us understand what these regulations do. And, and certainly the results of that will be transferable to other water bodies. So, you know, what we learn here is going to help us elsewhere, um, even if it means that, you know, a survey on a different lake might have to get pushed to a different year or something like that. So. Um, just prepping people for that. The other thing we have going on is the walleye stocking initiative. And we have a bunch of lakes in the area that are included in that. Um, in 2020, we're going to try to do three population estimates for lakes that have been stocked through the initiative. So this is trying to figure out, okay, we've done all this stocking. How many of this fish have survived? What sort of an adult fishery have we created? How many total walleye are out there um, as a result of those efforts? So Black Dan and Island and Durfee are they going to be the three that we try to, to get that data on in 2020. It's a little more intensive surveying. It involves clipping fins on some of these fish, um, letting them go, letting them mix back into the lake, coming back, surveying again, and then running some equations on the mixed ver or the clipped versus unclipped fish. In 2021, we're hoping to do that on Blueberry, which is another walleye stocking lake. Um, but we're also going to be doing a walleye population estimate on the Chippewa Flowage, which is going to be an incredible workload. We're going to be bringing in crews from all over the state to um, try and do that. Um, so that's going to, you know, that's going to suck up a lot of the, the, the effort uh, in the area. So Blueberry might be the only other lake we attempt that year. But then going forward, 2022, 2023, 2024, you know, we're going to be doing a number of these lakes every year and crews across the state are going to be doing the same. And so eventually we're going to have this really nice data set that says, here's how well walleye stocking works in different types of lakes. Here's what we know about stocking walleye at different rates. Um, and it'll be very useful for you know, our stocking program going forward. Um, the last section I want to talk about here deals with proposed fishing regulations. So um, I want to highlight the timeline here because this is really important and I want to make sure nobody misses this. We have a Conservation Congress hearing every year. Um, these, the, the changes I'm going to be talking about will not be on the Conservation Congress spring hearing in 2019 or 2020. Um, they're going to be in 2021. So right now what's happening, you know, is, is I've drafted these proposals. You're going to see them. Uh, they're being reviewed internally by our DNR teams and specialists. So if there's one related to walleye, we have a whole team of walleye specialists that look at that, supervisors, um, things like that, policy makers. Um, and these go all the way through to the Natural Resources Board and they kind of approve them to go out on the spring hearings. You'd see them in 2021 um, if they make it all the way to that point, which there's no guarantees. And then um, if these proposals are accepted by everybody, including the public, the earliest you would see them taking effect is spring of 2022, okay? So that's a really important thing. And I want to make sure we're doing everything to combat misinformation. None of these are going into effect in 2020. None of these are even going to be going into effect in 2021. The next couple of years are going to be spent talking about them, getting feedback, making sure everybody's on board. It's a long process, um, but I think it's important, you know, to make sure we don't rush forward with something that's going to be um, unpopular with the public or, you know, damaging to businesses, resorts, things like that. So those are all the folks that are going to get a kick at this, uh, these types of proposals before they go forward. So that's the caveat. I will probably say this again at the end too, um, but we'll look at some of the individual proposals here and they vary in complexity. So this one's pretty simple. Island of Black Dan Lake in the winter area. We had an 18 inch minimum length limit on these lakes. Um, the idea was we'd build up more walleye and maybe they'd eat a lot of the very abundant small panfish and make the panfish bigger. 
we've had that regulation in place for a long time and it, it really hasn't achieved what we hoped it would so we're just talking about reverting back to the statewide regulation for walleye in these lakes which in theory will provide a little bit more harvest opportunity kind of you know get rid of an unnecessary special regulation uh, or at least a, a special regulation that's not serving its purpose so um, that's the proposal there and that's just for walleye black dan and island um, yeah why okay good durfee and schoolhouse so um, if you've never fished these lakes they are connected effectively through a small channel under low water it's pretty tough to get a motorboat through there under high water which we've had recently it's very easy and so people can go back and forth and fish the two Durfee has a whole bunch of special regulations because it sets up as a really nice study lake so we're looking at bass walleye and panfish out there uh, kind of all at the same time those special regulations were not applied to schoolhouse lake because by the time they came around people weren't able to get into schoolhouse or wardens weren't going to be able to do much for enforcement back there now with the high water we've had the wardens are saying hey we really should have these regulations consistent between the two it's going to make our lives easier so this is the type of regulation we have sometimes that, that comes from our law enforcement staff um, it might actually make it easier for us to assess special regulations on these water bodies so um, that's kind of the, the background for these the proposed regulation would basically be to take all the regulations we have on Durfee and apply them also to schoolhouse so um next we have tiger cat flowage bass so uh, currently we just have the statewide limit for for bass on the tiger cat um the proposed regulation started as a conservation congress citizen resolution from a, a member of the tiger cat lake association wanting to see more protection on, on kind of medium and large size bass improving size structure and, and fishing quality there um, that would kind of move the harvest opportunity i'll show you in a second here um, so right now it's all the small fish are protected and the big ones are available to harvest and um, the, the change in approach here would be um, actually opening up harvest on those smaller fish and then protecting um, the mid-size and bigger fish and trying to you know push more fish up into the size range so that uh, better quality fishing opportunities um, more fun hopefully and so that's kind of the basis of, of that proposal and we have a new uh, fisheries management plan for the tiger cat flowage that talks about this type of stuff a little bit and supports it so um, even though this started as a congress question uh, it gets picked up by the dnr and so then i kind of look at all the data and, and our internal teams do so this one would appear in 2021 uh, and maybe take effect in 2021 along with all these others that i'm talking about all right the last couple and, and perhaps the most consequential because they're a large water body um, very harvest oriented species um, triple flowage walleye so currently we have the statewide limit which includes a 15 inch minimum and, and that higher slot protected 20 to 24. Um, i showed you the size structure earlier i'll show you a more detailed look at that what i have proposed is a regulation that doesn't exist anywhere else in the state and this is the one that i really want to caution people just because I proposed it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, this is what I'd like to see. I've talked to a lot of people. We put out some surveys. Maybe some of you took it, uh, trying to get anchor feedback on, on what they might like to see on the chip of flowage. Uh, so the proposed regulation is um, a three daily bag limit. You can harvest two walleye under 15 inches and one between 15 and 20. And that's it. Um, so this would put protection on any walleye over 20 inches. That may be somewhat controversial to a few people that trophy fish wouldn't be able to come home with you um, but as you're going to see it would it would put the maximum protection on on the bigger females which are important for reproduction so um yeah i basically just talked about that we want to allow a little more harvest of the smaller fish which are you know a lot of males and then protect the larger ones improve size structure and and have those females out there spawn so this this is the best way i have found to kind of illustrate what this regulation would be a lot going on here a lot of colors apologize apologies if, if you have issues um, with with color picking up colors uh, in your vision um, so we've kind of got three zones here right zone one is our harvest two area where you can harvest up to two walleye what you can see is look at all this green these are almost all males in this size range when we do our surveys so this would allow you to harvest two smaller fish most likely it's going to be two males our next zone you could harvest one if you catch one and that's our 15 to 20 inch zone here 
Um, here's where you kind of start to see a mix of males and females. Females are the red here. Um, and as you get higher in the size structure, you get more and more females. So this would moderate harvest on these mid-sized fish. And over time, I would expect that we'd probably see this size structure shift a little bit, where these medium-sized ones would be a little more common than they are right now. And then there'd be no harvest in this category up here, this, this 20 and over. Um, and that's almost all exclusively females. So again, over time, we'd probably see you know, a few more of these up here. But you do have to consider that it's not just har angling harvest that um, results in fish leaving the situation, le leaving the population. A lot of them die of natural causes too. So I don't expect that you know over time we'd eventually have you know all our fish up here because they're they're dying um, over time as as well. But this is kind of noisy here. Um, hopefully people kind of understand the general concept and, and certainly they'll be hearing more about this over time. Um, it's gonna be a couple of years that we'll be discussing this. The other change uh, that we're proposing for the chip of flowage, and this generally started as a citizen resolution, is, is reducing the panfish bag limit from 25 per day to 10 per day. So that would be all panfish combined. You could have five crappie, five bluegill, nine crappie, one perch, whatever, but 10 panfish. Um, this is, you know, kind of our standard toolbox option, so to speak, for, for a reduced bag limit. We weren't comfortable using the experimental panfish limits on a water body of this size and importance yet until they've been evaluated. Um, maybe it's something we'd switch to in the future if some of those are shown to be really successful. But for now, if, if there's concerns about panfish harvest, and I know a lot of people have it, um, this is the option that's, that's available to us. It's also about how low we'd have to go to see a reduction in angler harvest. A lot of people like the idea of a 15 bag or just reducing it to 20. Uh, when you look at the creel data and what people actually harvest, that's not going to change harvest significantly. 80% um, of anglers are harvesting 10 panfish or less already, uh, so this is not going to impact many people. Um, it, it, a limit of 15 or 20 would, would impact so few people that it, it probably wouldn't really have much of an impact in, on the overall population. And it is worth noting that the, the panfish populations are still going to be driven by some of the other big factors in there, including water level management and the number of predators out there. The more walleye we have in the lake, the less panfish we're going to have. Um, I think that, you know, the two changes that we proposed here for the chip work well together. Um, we're proposing a little less harvest of panfish as far as numbers of fish. If we see the size improve, you might still be able to take home about the same fillet weight. We've seen that happen. Um, but at the same time as we're proposing, you know, less numbers of panfish harvested, we're proposing to liberalize the walleye regulations, so you might be able to take a few more of them home. So um, that's kind of the big rundown on all our regulations. Oh, um, sorry, this figure shows panfish size uh, in relation to our, our different targets. So uh, this red zone is where we want to be for bluegill, this green zone is where we want to be for crappie, and then the lines here show where we've actually been. So you can see for bluegill size, we've mostly been lower than where we want to be. And for crappie size, we've kind of bounced around on the low end of our goal. Sometimes we've had little periods of time where size shot up. A reduced bag limit is more, more likely going to help improve size than it is going to result in more panfish in the lake um, for you to catch. We don't often see big changes in abundance, but, but we typically will see a little better size because anglers have to let some fish go, gives them an extra year to grow, and so you'll see that average size come up by, um, you know, sometimes fractions of an inch, sometimes an inch or more. So again, the timeline here, I, I just want to make sure that we're really clear on this. None of those things I just talked about are happening in 2020. Um, they're going to be on the Conservation Congress hearings in 2021 if they survive internal DNR review, which not all proposals do. Um, and then if they're supported all the way through that process, including the Conservation Congress, Natural Resources Board, Legislature, um, then they would maybe take effect in 2022. But as always, you know, I like to give people a really early preview on these things, um, let them know where and when they're going to be able to provide their input if they feel strongly in support or opposition, um, and make sure we get that feedback. I think that's, that's critically important. So um, thanks for coming. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks for clicking. Um, again, um, challenges with, 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 with this year, and I hope everybody out there is being safe and, and in good health. 
and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person at, at something in the near future. Um, for the time being, um, this will be uh, Max Walter signing off, and if you have questions or comments, we'll, we'll try and get a, a way for you to get those to us and get them answered. Thank you.